What a joy it is to worship our great God this morning. Uh, let us start off by giving a big round of applause to our wonderful choir. They can still sing beautifully, won't they? <laughs> and um, yes, and uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're sad that we're missing the boys, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, boys, don't worry, you, you're with me. So, <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> Well, Charlie, come on, hardcore? <laughs> you, 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 say, you say it was fun. So. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, let's take a moment to greet each other with a warm smile. Good morning. It's a blessing to worship with you today. Good morning. And today we have the privilege of immersing into God's Word and find the incredible wisdom and grace God has in store for us. And this morning we are turning our attention to the beautiful passage in Psalm 19. So uh, please turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 19, Psalm 19, Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. There's a remarkable Christian thinker named Francis Schaeffer who wrote a book called He is There and He is Not Silent. In his book, he makes a powerful statement. He wrote, The infinite personal God is there, but also He is not silent. That changes the whole world. He is there and is not a silent, not far off God. And what does that mean for us? It means that God is actively involved in our lives. Do you believe that? He isn't a distant figure who created the world and left it to run on its own. No, he is present, he is near, and he speaks to us. God's revelation comes to us in two primary ways, through the book of nature and through the book of scripture that we are about to see in Psalm 19. And this idea has roots that goes back to the 15th century with Francis Bacon who said, there are two books laid before us to study to prevent our failing into error. First, the volume of the scriptures which reveal the will of God, then the volume of creation which expresses his power. So the first book, the book of nature, is all around us. And Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, describes how the heavens declare the glory of God. The nature, every day and night, is speaking to us about God's glory and majesty and power. But God didn't stop there. He also gave us the book of Scripture. And verses 7 to 14 talk about how the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul how God's word is so trustworthy, making the wise simple, uh, making wise. And, and, and so Psalm 19 is divided very nicely into two sections. We can know about God through the book of nature from verses 1 to 6 and from the book of scripture from verses 7 to 14. It beautifully ties these two together, showing us that God is constantly speaking to us if, if we only take the time to listen. So first, let us look at verse 1. Please look at verse 1 with me, and let's see how David opens the Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. As David writes, the heavens, including the moon, sun, planets, and stars, are constantly announcing the greatness and awesomeness of God. When David mentions the sky above, he's referring to the lower atmosphere where clouds float and birds fly. And this expanse is like a grand canvas showcasing the work of the divine craftsman. And the words declare and proclaim are very powerful words. They mean an ongoing, constant revelation. So just imagine for a second the heavens persistently declaring God's glory. And the sky is continually proclaiming his handiwork. This revelation isn't just a one-time event, but a constant, never-ending display of God's splendor. Then David continues in verse 2. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Picture a river flowing its banks, continuously pouring out its waters. Similarly, creation continuously bubbles up and overflows with revelation about God. Without the darkness of night, we wouldn't see the stars, the Milky Way, 
or the vast galaxies with our naked eyes. The night sky shouts to us that God exists and that he is magnificent. Then verse 3 tells us they have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. And this might seem contradictory at first, but what it is simply saying is the fact that nature's message is a wordless testimony visible to everyone and everywhere. Even though the nature does not speak, the pour, pour out the speech, but the wordless testimony is visible to everyone. And silent decora- declaration reaches every town, every continent, every nation, and every people. No one is excluded from hearing this message that nature is declaring about God. Then verse 4 emphasizes this, this worldwide revelation. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Everyone has seen it. Everyone has heard it. You and I included. And Charles Spurgeon beautifully captures the, this idea when he says, although the heavenly bodies move in solemn silence, yet in reason's ear they utter precious teachings. The heavens in this speak of God's glory, even in their silent march across the sky. Then in verses 4 to 6, David, 5 to 6, David uses the imagery of the sun to convey God's glory. If you look at the bottom of verse 4, he says, In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. So imagine for a moment the sun is 93 million miles away, but its light and warmth are crucial for our lives, and we are feeling that today. And David likens the sun to a bridegroom, if you see in the verse, coming out of his chamber on his wedding day. So picture this, the anticipation, the joy of the sunrise, the splendor as the bridegroom steps out, dressed in his fine, finest, ready to meet his bride. The sun, in this metaphor, emerges with the same joy and brilliance and radiance each day. What a beautiful psalm. And it's a symbol of joy and new beginning, shining brightly in the sky, just as the bridegroom is adorned in beauty and ready to celebrate. And we behold that every morning. Then David described the son as an athlete as well. He said in verse 5, the bottom of verse 5, like a champion, like an athlete running its course. Think of a marathon runner starting at one end and tirelessly running to the other. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, faithfully covering the expanse of the heavens each day. Its heat reaches everywhere, leaving nothing untouched. And the consistent journey of the sun reflects God's glory, his power, and his faithfulness. So from verses 1 to 6, we see how the nature, even though they don't utter speech, they declare about God's power his majesty, his beauty, how he is a beautiful creator, the artist. So from this verse, six verses, we want to think about five crucial lessons we can draw from that. And the first is, of course, is that creation reveals the existence of God. Will you say amen? When we look at the sun, the stars, the mountains, and the oceans, we see the fingerprints of a creator. The beauty and complexity of the natural world point to us, showing us that he is real and powerful. The design in nature is not random events. It's intentional. It has meaning and purposeful, crafted by a divine hand. Secondly, this knowledge of God through creation is universal, right? Everywhere on earth, 
People can look up and see the sun, the stars, and the wonders of nature. And you may have imagined that you may have a place in your mind, the be- most beautiful place that you have been to uh, in your own mind. And this visual testimony transcends language and culture. It's a message that speaks to all humanity, showing that God's presence and power are evident and accessible to everyone and everywhere all the time. Thirdly, the magnificence of creation declares God's power and glory. The vastness of the universe, the intricate details of life, and the harmonious functioning of nature all display God's mighty power. When we marvel at the sunset or the night sky filled with stars, we're witnessing the grandeur of God's incredible power and wisdom. Fourthly, the one thing that we need to think about is there are those who look to nature or astrology for answers and guidance, falling into superstition. They seek knowledge in the stars. They can only be truly found in Scripture. And while nature points us to God and His greatness, we must always understand it's the Bible that provides us with the specific knowledge of His will, His love, and His plan for our salvation. Nature is a signpost pointing to God, but the Bible is the detailed map that guides us to him. Then fifthly and lastly, we need to think about this point that many modern secularists and atheists fail to see beyond the physical world to the creator it points to. And it has been permeated in the educational system of our children that they, they might study the universe with scientific precision, but really miss the spiritual truth it reveals. They see the artwork, beautiful artwork, but they deny the existence of the artist. We as believers need to recognize that while science can explain how things work, it's our faith that tells us why they exist. They exist to declare and glorify God. Amen? Nature reveals God's glory to everyone leaving us without excuse. That's what one, verses 1 to 6 says. But while nature can show us and point us to God that he exists, but he cannot save us. Nature cannot save us. Salvation comes only from the gospel, hearing from the word of God, which is found in scripture. So God made himself fully known to us through the second book of scripture. That's what verses 7 to 14 is about. Nature alone is not enough. The person needs the gospel. They need the scriptures to understand the good news of Christ, the Son of God, that the good news that the, the fallen humankind can be reconciled to God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the, through the Bible that we learn about God's grand plan of salvation and how we can live a life that pl- pleases him. So from uh, the remaining verses, uh, David provides a rich testimony about the scriptures. So please look at verse 7 with me. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. When we talk about the law, we are really t- talking about the word of God, his commandments, his teachings, including everything he wants us to know about him. David calls this law perfect. So think about that for a moment. Perfect, meaning it needs no additions and cannot have anything taken away from it. It's flawless in every way. Now, what does this perfect law promise us to do? The Bible promises in verse 7 that it refreshes our soul. It's like taking a deep breath of fresh air for our spirits. Imagine feeling worn out and burdened and then encounter something that completely refreshes you. You may have that experience. When you're spiritually burdened and worn out, where do you go? You go to the word of God. That's what God's word does for us and it promises us and we can rely on God's promise. It revives us, brings us back to our true selves and restores our inner being and that's why we are here on Sunday morning that even though we may lose the sense of joy and peace as we work outside of the world, when we come into this place, God will re-strengthen you, re-instill the peace and joy in your heart once again through his word. Next, we have the latter part of verse 7, which says, The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The statutes refer to God's decree. In other words, his word, once again. 
The statutes are trustworthy, it says, meaning they're reliable, dependable, and always true. They're never unstable or questionable. We can always trust God's word to lead us in the right direction. Now, what does it do for us? It says they make the simple wise. This is powerful because it shows that God's word can transform even the most naive and undiscerning people into someone wise. We all need wisdom, don't we? We face countless decisions daily, and having wisdom helps us make the right choices. So the Bible provides this wisdom, enabling us to see the life with God's perspective, with God's lens. So if you want to live a life that truly makes sense, we must immerse ourselves into the Word of God. Moving on to verse 8 with me, it says, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Precepts here means the rules, regulations of God, guidance of God for our living. And these precepts are described as right, meaning they are always correct and can be counted on to provide truth and accuracy. And what does it promise us to have? It says they bring joy to our hearts. So if you're ever feeling down or lacking joy, dive into God's word. There's a profound joy and gladness that comes from living according to God's guidelines and his plans for us. It's like finding a treasure that brings lasting happiness. God's word is a wellspring of joy that never runs dry. You can always count on. Source of gladness that will uplift your heart as you go into your daily lives. Then let's dive into the fourth point in the second half of verse 8. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Scriptures are described as radiant, meaning they are pure and free from any impurity or evil. Unlike murky and misleading messages we often encounter in life, God's word is clear and illuminating. It shines brightly, helping us to see the path we should take. Just like a bright light in a dark room, the Bible helps us to see things clearly. Think of like the lighthouse guiding ships safely to shore. When we follow the word, God's word and his teachings, we find joy and understanding that brightens our lives, showing us the way to live according to God's will. Then let us consider the fifth point in verse 9. It says, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord. Which is, once again, another label David uses for scripture. Refers to profound respect and reverence for God, which the Bible instills in us. It's about recognizing his greatness and holiness. And it is pure, flawless, untainted by any falsehood. And it endures forever. It never changes. Relevance never fades in our lives. Then moving on to the sixth point. The the letter half of verse 9, the decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. The decrees, once again, God's instructions, the judgment about how we live. These are not just random rules. They are God's divine principles that guide our conduct. And when we say they are firm, we mean they are trustworthy, unchanging. It is a standard of truth and righteousness. And when it says all of them are righteous, emphasize that every part of God's word is just and true. Because God wrote it, we talked about it is the breath of God. The inspiration of scripture is the breath of God. So that God's character is really instilled in the scripture. So when it says all of them are righteous, it reflects God's own nature who is perfectly righteous and holy. Because God is holy and just, his word, the breath of God, the inspiration, the written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is a perfect reflection of his character, providing us with a flawless guidance to live a righteous life. So we cover all the six points once again through how the book of Scripture can help us to know about God and how it benefits us, how it uh, promises us and you can hold on to these promises so when you go back home read this passage again and see what the bible the daily meditation of the bible promises you it promises you those things wonderful things and 
Lastly, we want to talk about the value of Scripture. David ends with the value of Scripture in verse 10. So would you please take a look at verse 10 with me. It says, They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Imagine having a treasure chest full of the pure gold. Even that wouldn't compare to the worth of God's word. The things we consider valuable in this world, like wealth and material possessions, pale in comparison to the riches found in Scripture. The Bible offers wisdom, guidance, and truth. And most of all, are the truth about our salvation that money cannot buy. It is invaluable treasure that surpasses all earthly wealth. And when we immerse ourselves in God's word, we gain something far more precious than anything we can ever want. It is also sweeter than honey. Think about the sweetest thing you've ever tasted, right? Maybe a fresh drop of honey straight from the honeycomb. I'm craving for a large T-bone steak right now, and um, it's, it's not time yet, but, but <laughs> it's delicious and satisfying. But the sweetness of Scripture is even greater, much more delicious. Well, honey delights our taste, but for a moment, the Bible brings lasting satisfaction to our souls. It meets our deepest spiritual needs and brings joy and fulfillment that nothing else can provide. And we can grow in the faith and regularly engage with the Bible, and we'll, be, we'll find it more delightful and satisfying. Then David tells us towards the end that about the immense benefits he receives from the perfect and precious scriptures. That's in verse 11. And this will, this will be the final verse we'll read. He says, By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. So by them, by the scripture, Bible is like a vigilant guardian for our souls, constantly alerting us to sin and spiritual dangers. So imagine as a loyal watchdog, always on the lookout, barking furiously at the sight of any evil or wickedness approaching. God's word, that's what he does for us, verse 11. By them, your servant is warned. Keeping them, there is great reward. It teaches us how to live rightly and avoid the pitfalls of life. It guides our steps and leads us to a richer and abundant life. So as we wrap up our study of Psalm 19, we've seen how God's revelation comes through both nature and scripture, each playing a unique role in drawing us closer to him. There are two books laid before us to study, as Francis Bacon said in the 15th century, to prevent our failing into error. First, the volume of creation expresses his power and glory. Second, the volume of scripture reveals the will of God. For us. So we call the nature God's general revelation. We call it a general revelation that everyone can see. God's creation, a powerful testament to his existence and majesty. And the Romans says that no one is excused from not knowing about this existence of God when they see this beautiful nature. They are God's masterpieces that are designed to speak to our hearts. But that itself is not enough to save us nor to know him fully. So he gave us the second revelation, the special revelation is called, which is the scripture. So we've seen how it emphasized the perfection of the scripture, trustworthiness, and joy found in scripture, scriptures, refreshes our souls, give us the wisdom, lights our path. So as for the practical steps for daily living, really take time each day to observe and appreciate God's creation around us. Right? It's beautiful. Our, we, we, have a, we, are, we are blessed to have a beautiful town, right? beautiful, the nature. And set aside a few minutes daily to read the Bible. Right? And we're already doing the Bible re- reading plan, and many of us are telling how wonderful it is, how, how it's changing their spiritual journeys. So, so pray for understanding and a- ask God to speak to you through his word. You can pray the word. You can pray the word. As you pray to God, you can recite the word that you read, and you can pray the word. There's a thing called praying the word. And you pray to God that way. And, re- and as you receive 
the God's word every Sunday morning. I try to reflect on how scripture, uh, how can I reply, apply the truth into my life? What is God teaching me uh, through this passage? And you can think about that uh, throughout the week. So remember, as Francis Schaeffer said in the beginning, God is not silent. He speaks to us through the beauty of nature and clarity of scripture. And his words remind us that God is there and actively involved in our lives. Remember that he is near. Psalm 19 teaches us he is near. He cares. And he communicates with you. And our role is to listen, read, respond, and let his word transform us. So as we live here today, may we be more attuned to God's voice, more committed to his word, and more in awe of his creation. And let's allow his revelations to draw us closer to him, transform our hearts, and guide our lives. I bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Many times we, when you gather in this place, we may have the feeling of anxiety, fears, and the emptiness that God is silent somehow, that God doesn't respond to my prayers. But Psalm 19 teaches us a different story. God has always been speaking to us. God was always near us. We just had to open our spiritual heart and eyes to see the beauty and glory through his creation and how he wants what his will is, what his plans are through the word of scripture. All we had to do was to just open our spiritual hearts and eyes a little more. God is there. God is not silent. And he's there right now listening to our prayers. So at this time, to lay down all your burdens in prayers, you will have your personal prayers this morning that you brought into this place. Lay it down. Cry out to God because he's there. He's listening. He's near. He's been always speaking as the sun, like the athlete going from the east to west. He was always there. And he's always ready to speak to us through his word. So let's pray at this time. Your personal prayer requests, lift them up to God at this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word today, Lord. Lord, we are thankful that you are not a silent God. You're always with us. Lord, thank you for that assurance, Lord. Lord, we lift up our prayers to you, Lord. Lord, give us peace. Our Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that you are near us. You listen to our prayers, and you are not silent. You have always been speaking to us through the two volumes of the books, the book of nature, the book of scripture. Lord, may we take the time to see the beauty of your creation and marvel at your grace and power, Lord. And may we immerse ourselves into the Word of God daily because it refreshes our soul, because it lightens our path, and it fills our heart with joy, sweeter than honey, more precious than pure gold. Lord, Lord if there are any hurting souls in this place, heal them, touch them. And may we open our hearts to lift up our prayers to you, knowing that you are near us. and You are never a silent God. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.